Hey there, this is your host, Dr. Lori Friesen, and you're listening to episode number 12 of Beginning Teacher Talk. Just because you're a beginning elementary teacher, there is no need for you to struggle like one. I'm dedicated to being the mentor for you that I wish I had when I first started teaching. In this podcast, we talk about all of the -the behind-the-scenes stuff about teaching you really need to know but didn't learn when you were in university. And we share the most amazing resources, tips, and strategies out there so you can become the teacher you've always dreamed of being. Let's start the show. Well, hey there, this is Dr. Lori Friesen, and welcome to episode number 12, the best six games to play with your students, how to review content without wasting time. Oh, you're going to love this one. It's so much fun. I love playing games with my students. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to send a quick reviewer shout out to one of my awesome listeners. This review is from Blondie1462, and she writes, by the way, I love that name, Blondie1462. She writes, Dr. Lori's podcast for beginning teachers is uplifting and inspiring. As a seasoned teacher, I found the segments refreshing and meaningful and loaded with great ideas to implement in the classroom. She offers a personable approach that makes you feel as if she's mentoring you wherever you may be, in the car or at the gym. I found myself laughing right alongside with her at her personal anecdotes and felt an immediate calm at her helpful strategies for reducing my daily overwhelm. This podcast will give you the encouragement and support teachers desperately need in this profession. This series will help you with building essential classroom management, student engagement, and addressing the needs of differentiated learners in an engaging way. I highly encourage you to check it out. Oh my gosh. Blondie 1462, I love your spirit. And I am very, very grateful for your kind kind words. I work really, really hard, you guys, to pay close attention to what you guys need as teachers. And it means the world to me to know that what I'm doing is actually helping you. So thank you so very much. I love hearing from my listeners. Okay, so let's get on to this week's topic. Oh, the games we play. This is going to be such a fun episode. Now, before we get into the games themselves, let's talk about a few quick tips to ensure that playing games with your students is safe and effective. So make sure the space is safe, move back furniture, and ensure your students have enough space to play. They're not going to be hitting each other. Um, pay attention to how animated everyone is getting. If they're starting to get a little nuts, you may need to stop and have them take a few deep breaths before you continue. Um, and make sure nobody is feeling left out or will feel stupid or publicly shamed in any way. We really have to be a- paying attention to how children are experiencing these games. Um, and then I make sure I close my door to to ensure we don't disturb my neighbors. So you might want to check with them to make sure that your neighbors aren't testing or doing something that requires quiet during the time that you're planning to play. I also taught and encouraged my students to do silent cheers so we wouldn't be disruptive to other classes. And I explained that we'd be able to play games more often if we weren't super loud. So for silent cheers, they just imagine that they're doing all the same cheers that they would normally do, but in whisper voices. And so they, you know, they can put their arms up and cheer and do all sorts of things like say, congratulate people and cheer them on, but in whispers. So it works really well, actually. And then after your students have played the game, have them rate the game. What did they like about it? What did they not like about it? And talk about how you could improve the game for next time. And then finally, I want to encourage you to really pay attention to how much you think your students are actually learning when they play. So, of course, we shouldn't be using valuable instructional time to play a game that isn't actually helping our students to learn. Now, I'm going to only share games here with you that are literally the best I've found. And by best, I mean the simplest to prepare because I'm all about working smarter, not harder, that are the least expensive, and number three, get the biggest bang for the buck when it comes to really understanding what my students know. All right, so let's get on to the games. Number one is called Slap. Now to play this game, my students love this one. You're going to need two fly swatters in different colors. And I always like to add a bit of sparkly ribbon tied to the fly swatter for some added magic and pizzazz. And you're going to need your whiteboard. 
Now, to play, for ease of explanation, let's assume you're wanting to review basic addition and subtraction facts to 10. I know most of you will be doing things much more advanced than that, but let's just use this for simplicity's sake. So if you're going to review basic addition and subtraction facts to 10, you're going to print random numbers from 1 to 10 on the whiteboard, or if you have a projector, you would project them onto your whiteboard. Okay. So, and be sure not to print them in a row, but kind of scattered all over the place. So your numbers are going to be scattered on your screen. Now divide the class into two teams with a piece of masking tape on the floor to indicate where the start line is. So they have to be behind the start line. And then you can call out a math fact, for example, three plus six equals, and the first person to slap the correct answer with his or her fly spotter earns a point for their team. And we often don't even keep score. It's just too much fun to play and nobody seems to care who wins anyway. But um, this game can become quite noisy. So again, I encourage silent cheers as we play. And I love this game because it's a fun, it's versatile, it's so quick to prepare and so motivating for the students. So to make it really simple, I have the students, once they're in two teams, I have them line up in two rows on the, on the carpet. We move the desks back and have them um, line up right along on the carpet. So they're kind of free of their desks and they're in a different space. And they can kind of see where their turn's coming up. So they love that. I've linked to some really pretty, brightly colored fly swatters that you can add to your card on Amazon right away if you like this idea. Um, and by the way, you can check out all of the links I refer to in this episode at drlauriefriesen.com in episode number 12. So if you're at the gym or you're driving, you can easily get all of this in the show notes on episode number 12 at drlauriefriesen.com. Okay, the second game that my students love is Student Jeopardy. Now, there's a reason you're going to find this game on pretty much every teacher's list. It not only works, but my students absolutely love it. Now, to keep this game simple, I don't even prepare categories. I just project a row of $100 or $200 increments on the board up to $1,000 behind each student. Okay, so I'll send a visual of this for you or I'll post a link so you can see actually what this looks like on my website so you can check it out after. But I elect one student to be in charge of keeping score for the game and then I just have them use a magnet to keep score of where each team is. So you can prepare review questions in advance or you can just keep your teaching notes or lesson plans open for whatever subject you're using to play this game to make up questions as you go or you can use a student's notebook who you know is a little smarty pants, like pick one of your students who you know has probably got most of the answers already written perfectly and correctly to create quick questions from. So then I just place three desks at the front of the room with buzzers. Oh my gosh, they're so cute. They actually have like little imitation game show buzzers on Amazon that you can buy now. Or you can use tambourines from the dollar store instead of buzzers and just lay one on each of the three desks flat side down. Because when the students slap them, they sound like buzzers. They give the same feeling that buzzers do, right? They make a great noise. So I divide my class into three teams and then I number my students. So for example, if we have three teams of seven students, every student has a number between one and seven. And that way I can randomly call up groups of students and they never know when their number is going to be called. So it keeps everyone on their toes. So when I call a number to the front of the room, one student from each team stands behind each desk facing the class with one hand behind his or her back and the other hand over the buzzer. So they love this because it feels like they're right on the game show. So as soon as you ask the question, they get one buzz to try to answer the question. And the first person, of course, to slap their buzzer first gets to answer the question. Now, if they get the question correct, if they answer the question correctly, they get $100 for their team. So you just have your person who's in charge move the magnet up $100 for that team. If they don't answer it correctly, the correct answer is offered by the audience. And that keeps everybody involved because they're just itching to you know, call out the answer. And by the way, if someone from another team calls out the answer and when one person has buzzed it, that team, the one who's actually buzzed gets the points. So they don't want to call out from the audience. <laughs> Now, to make things less chaotic during the game, I found it works best to allow only three questions for each pair of students. So every pair of students gets, you know, three chances to answer three different questions. And then I mix up the order of the numbers, as I mentioned, so that students stay on their toes. You know, if, I'm, if I've called number twos, then I might call number fives next. 
And the beauty of this game is that it's very versatile. I've used it to reinforce skills and concepts in a wide variety of subject areas across the curriculum. So I've used it to review science. If there, if they have a lot of content in a science unit and we need to review for a test the next day or in the next couple of days, that it's a really good game to play. Um, and you can download a free customizable Jeopardy game by visiting Teachers Pay Teachers. And I um, connected to that link for you in the show notes for this episode. And I also linked to the super cute buzzers that I got on Amazon to play this game. I love them. Or you can also get tambourines, which I also linked to, which sometimes actually can last a little longer than the buzzers and they don't require batteries. So, you know, you can choose which option you think is best for you. Number three, the game that my students love is called Whiteboard Winners. I just made that up. I don't even know, but you can call it whatever you want. And students love this game for its simplicity and so do I. So if you don't already have a class set of whiteboards, the mini whiteboards for their laps, I think they call them lap boards. It's well worth investing in some because you will quickly find that they are so versatile and you can use them in so many ways. Now for this game, for reviewing content, all I do is call out a question from the front of the room and I have my students write their answers on their whiteboards. And I often have students do this in pairs so they can help each other with students taking turns doing the writing for each question. And then they hold them up and the first correct answer wins a point for their team. So there's a variation on this game. If you don't have whiteboards, you can call pairs of students to the front of the room so that nobody is left feeling stupid. You know, um, so the, the team decides on the answer and they write it on the whiteboard, but they're standing up there together, you know, so it feels a little bit less vulnerable. Now, if nobody has the correct answer, then the next two pairs, um, come up and I ask the question again. And by the way, it's really quite hilarious if you ask the same question several times in a row every now and then, because it not only reinforces especially important or challenging content, but because students don't expect it every really throws them off and they love it. So I've linked to 12 pack, packs of 12 whiteboards that you can grab on Amazon in the show notes for episode number 12, if you want to check that out. Now, game number four is, I call it a small group challenge. And it's really just group work that you're turning into a game, but kids love it because they like the little twist on it. So for this game, I give each group, um, Oh, sorry. For this game, each small group in my class is competing for some kind of a small prize. So I give each group of four students a list of review questions that they need to work together to answer. And the first group to finish puts their hands up to let you know that they've completed it. But here's the kicker. They need to say their answers out loud. And of course, in doing so, they give a clue to other groups about answers they're stuck on. So I encourage them to be careful about, I mean, they want to do it quickly and, and answer all the questions to put their hands up first, but they take a risk if they don't do it carefully because they have to put, say all their answers out loud, right? So if you give a clue to other groups about answers that they might be stuck on, then if any of the other groups have any of their answers incorrect, they can, they can get the answers, right? So if that group has any of their answers incorrect, I don't tell them which ones are wrong. Instead, I just tell them that they don't have them all correct yet. So everyone goes back to the drawing board and tries to figure out which answers might be wrong. And the next group to put up their hands then reads out their answers. And this continues until one group has finally figured out all the answers and gets the prize. So then we review, we have everybody and all of the groups actually put the correct answers down uh, to make sure that they know which answers are actually correct for the test. So you can get, um, I've linked to a class pack of assorted prizes on Amazon, but honestly, I would love to see you get a little more creative with the prizes that you give. And maybe it's, you know, a little bit of extra time to play a game for that group, or maybe it's a special person award, which for me in my classroom, a special person award means they get extra privileges in the classroom that other students might not get. So start to get creative with maybe how you might give your students a really great um, reward for earning, for winning this challenge. Okay. Number five, whole class snakes and ladders. Oh, my students love this one. And it's so simple. So again, just prepare some review questions in advance or have your um, teacher book open, your curriculum book open to whatever content you want to review with them. So you can make up the questions as you go. 
And then to play, all you need to do is to project a snakes and ladders game onto the board, onto your projector. And you could do this pretty with pretty much any game board that you have, but snakes and ladders works because it's so simple. Then you divide your class into small groups. So each group gets a different colored marker on the projected game board. So they don't have anything at their desks. The game board is projected on the on your projector. So each group gets a different colored marker and each group member takes rolling the dice takes turns rolling the dice when it's their group's turn. So each time they roll the dice, they need to work together to answer a question correctly before they're able to move their marker. And of course, the first team to win the end first wins a small prize. So the rules are that they really need to work together in order to come up with an answer. So it can't be always the same person, although you know it is usually one or two of the students who usually know. Um, but you know, encourage group work for this. And I've linked again to a free snakes and ladders game that you can click on and download right away. And I really like this one because like the last game, it really gets kids working together and talking and you don't even have to have them move spaces physically, but I like to ask them to stand up when it's their turn to keep them actively involved. And so everyone knows, oh, it's that group's turn. So that's another way you can get them moving a little bit. So you can use a lot of different game boards, like I said, to review content in this way, but it's just another fun way to add a twist to reviewing content. Okay. And then my final sixth game, you're going to say, oh, everyone plays this, but it's so much fun. Who wants to be a millionaire? Now I came up with this takeoff on the popular game show. Oh my gosh, I'm going to date myself. It was like, I want to say 20 years ago. Can it be that long? Oh my gosh. Okay. Anyway, one day when I wanted to review a tricky science unit with my class, I thought, oh my gosh, how could I do this creatively? And there are so many versions of this game available for classroom use online. But again, I'm going to offer a word of caution here. You do not need, nor should you spend hours preparing a review game just because it looks cool. So don't fall into that trap. Again, work smarter, not harder. So on a beautiful spring evening or weekend, please don't spend precious hours of your life making a customized game for a subject you'll probably only use for a half hour in class. So I found a cute and simple template of this game that you can use for only $1.99 on Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, and the point of this game is to review content. So you can just easily, just as easily ask these questions out loud from your textbook or from student notes as you play the game as you know, don't go ahead and type them all in on beautiful displays and you don't have to do that. Just ask them out loud from your textbook. So I've linked to that version of who wants to be a millionaire in the show notes of this episode for you. So you just need again to go to episode number 12. Now for students who make it all the way to $1 million, I give them a pretend, but looks really real million dollar bill, which you can get on Amazon you can get 10 of them for only $5.95. So that's pretty awesome. And I've included the link for you. Now here's how to play the game. So I place two chairs just below the game display and I just use a magic marker as my microphone. And I have all of the students put their name on a small piece of paper to be put in a draw so that they can, their name can be spontaneously drawn, right? So in the real game show, the audience is supposed to ask or answer a fast finger question. So I have the students imagine they have a keyboard in front of them and they pretend they're punching in and answer as fast as they can while I draw out a student's name. Now you could actually ask a question, but they don't seem to really even care. I mean, I was teaching second grade when I used this the most, so they didn't care. They were just having fun pretending they were answering a question. And then using my very best Regis impersonation, I welcomed my new guest to this to the show. So I'd say, welcome to Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Are you ready to play? And so they get all excited and the students do a silent cheer. And then the student is willing to become anyone they would like to for the game show and from wherever they want to live. And I find that this really helps to alleviate some of the stress of like being at the front of the room in front of their classmates. So they get really creative. I'd had, I've had like Martians from California and astronauts from Greece on my show. You know, I've had some pretty amazing, (laughs) amazing students. 
So I just use a student scribbler, a notebook, or my experiment write-ups if I'm reviewing science to ask questions of my guest. So I, I begin with a very simple question. I usually start with very low-level simple questions to help the students gain confidence and then move on to some of the more difficult concepts or vocabulary as the stakes get higher. So one of the ki- things my kids love the most about the game is how successful and supported they feel knowing that the they have the assistance of the three lifelines should they get stuck. So you'll see the three lifelines on the template for this game, which they love being able to ask the audience, for example, when they get stuck on a question. Now, if the student answers all of the students, sorry, if the student answers all of the questions correctly, they earn the million dollar bill, which is really cool. And I also have small rewards for anyone who doesn't reach the million dollar mark. And of course, because I have all of the students' names in a bag that I keep especially for this game, everyone gets a chance to compete by the end of the school year. But if you're coming to this game towards the end of the school year, you might want to add your own special twist by allowing students to compete in pairs so you can ensure that everyone gets a chance to play before the end of the school year. So my students used to ask to play this game whenever they could, and I was sure to fit it in about once every two weeks to review spelling words and phonics and science and social studies or challenging vocabulary in all subject areas, but the possibilities really are endless. So those, my friends, are my favorite six games that you can use in any subject area and at any grade level to review content not only at the end of the year, but throughout the year. And on that note, if you are thinking about what you want to get for your students as an end of the year gift, be sure to check out my favorite thing to do for my students at the end of the school year. It's called the best end of the year student gifts, a week of special celebrations. Oh my gosh. I know your students are going to love it as much as mine have. I hope you have a wonderful week. And remember, just because you're a beginning teacher, there is no need for you to struggle like one. My goal is to give you the best tools, tips, and resources so even experienced teachers come to you and ask, where did you get that fabulous idea? All right, see you again next week and bye for now.